I'm not sure I can start with a good evening. It's a troubled evening across South Africa as we say hello from Dan Really Likes Wine. Trouble time for the wine industry continues after the two-week extension of the ban. Trouble time for the country as a whole as we find ourselves in very, very uncertain waters. And... Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to find words at a time like this, and uh, it does often feel just a little on the on the hopeless side. But as we always do on the show, we'll try and give you a reason to smile, and we certainly do need one as we talk through some great South African wine and get a reminder of the wonderful, wonderful wine that awaits us when we are allowed to resume normal service in an industry that does South Africa so proud and is such an important, if currently stalled part of our economy. Another two weeks, I fervently hope that that is when uh, the consistent hanging of the blame around the neck of the alcohol industry will come to an end and we'll be able to find a way to navigate back into some slightly more comfortable spaces. So what are we doing to try and put that smile back on the face today? Well, uh, we've got some bubbles and it might seem an odd time to be drinking bubbles, but uh, we're raising a glass to better times ahead, as surely there must be, uh, but also in celebration of those 50 years of Cup Classique in South Africa, uh, 50 years that we celebrate throughout the year on Dan Really Likes Wine, and that we will continue to do, and we've got some rather nice Blanc de Blanc to sample, and then a really cool story from a fairly young wine brand as we find out what inspired the name behind it, how the wine is made and tastes some Chardonnay and some Shiraz. That brand is called Fram. I said with emphasis because it's all in capital letters. It is Fram. And I think it's named after a Norwegian boat, but I'll get Tina Skler to give us the details a little later on. Now, to start with, though, uh, we head to an estate, to a name, to a brand that is far older. In fact, it goes back to 1691. Uh, the estate is Laborie. It's part of the KWV empire. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were drinking the Mentors with Azel, who is behind the Mentors range, the resident mad scientist of the KWV cellar. Today, we head over to Laborie and one of Azel's colleagues, uh, Corbus, joins us, the winemaker at Laborie. Corbus, warm welcome. Lovely to have you on. Dan really likes wine. Hi, Dan. Um, thank you, and nice to be on the show. I think there's a history lesson that needs to kick off the show because there's history to both Laborie and to your own involvement in the wine industry. Let's start with Laborie, 330 years old. That's some pretty impressive heritage. Yes, uh, Laborie is actually one of the older farms in the industry. Um, as you said, uh, from 1691, um, it was first handed over to the Tylerford family by Simon van Estel. And uh, they said seven years later, they made the first drinkable wine, um, 1698. Um, and actually, I would have loved to taste that wine. Um, but it was known to be one of the best in the colony. Um, yeah, and today, the focus is still on producing high-quality uh, wine um, that ranges from the Cup Classique to the still uh, white wine and also the red wine. And there's also a nice dessert wine, the Pinot de Labrie. What does it mean to you then as a winemaker to be charged with producing wine from a name that goes back over three centuries? Well, the pressure is on, um, but uh, that's why we are winemakers and uh, enjoying it and uh, exploring the terroir that the, the vineyards are planted on, um, looking back at the heritage of the wine, the style, the quality. And just lining in and focusing on producing that that same quality, um, that same style, and over the years try to to um, lift the quality, um, and in that case, yeah, help to build the brand and and, and lift the sales. It's a job that you've you've probably got running in your veins, really, because your own personal mm -hmm. history. You you grew up in the wine industry, so to speak, didn't you? Yes, I actually grew up in the, in Montague, which is a, the, the small Karoo. Um, so my dad had a farm, um, planted the vineyards, and there were some apricots and peaches and olives and all that things. But uh, the vineyards intrigued me the most, um, especially when I was just a little guy uh, driving with my father to the winery, um, offloading the grapes, and uh, fascinated by the machines and the process. And uh, bombarding him with a lot of questions that he still doesn't 
or we can't answer at this stage, but uh, it still fascinated me. Um, and that's for the that's the reason why I went to study uh, for for winemaker, um, and I also went uh, just to do some harvest, uh, especially overseas, New Zealand, America, um, and I think that was the best <laughs> the best time of uh, of winemaking, going overseas, learning, um, and yeah, now today um, I'm about nine years, almost nine years at at KWV or Labrie. Tell me a little bit about that time abroad, because I'm always fascinated by the journey so many of our winemakers have taken. Uh, time in New Zealand, uh, where I'm sure in between conversations about who has the best rugby team, there was uh, much <laughs> wine talk, uh, and then time in America. Uh, what were the highlights of those experiences, and how did they shape your approach to winemaking? Yeah, it was always fun, as you said, now the conversations with the space in New Zealand with the rugby um, I know once we the storm was played uh, in New Zealand uh, at the time that we were there, and um, the coach the name of that stage was Kubus van der Mere. So uh, I got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of a lot of jokes going around with me as the coach, um, and we did win New Zealand at that stage. So it didn't go well in the winery, and everybody's moody. Um, but I think yeah, the best thing of going overseas and doing the harvest uh, is to see. The industry there, um, learning the wine styles, um, learning the regions, um, learning some techniques, although winemaking technique is more or less the same if you go everywhere, um, but there's always a secret uh, in learning in what the winemakers do. Um, America was also also fascinating for me, different cultivars that, that we are used to, um, but just to see the great Napa, um, and all the wineries, all the, the known wineries, knowing the region, learning the wine styles. Um, I think broadening, broadening your world um, in, and your knowledge of the wine industry, I think that, that is possibly the best uh, to take back home. What would you say from having spent time in these two countries was the element of each experience that, that surprised you the most, something that you maybe took for granted in terms of winemaking, uh, life in, in the world of wine in South Africa, and suddenly discovered it was way different in New Zealand and in America? Um, yes, I think looking at uh, especially the, the quality of the, the the cultivars that are known to these to these um, different countries, especially in New Zealand, um, the Sauvignon Blancs, um, and in the lesser known the Chardonnays, how, how great uh, their quality is. Um, and you always think when you when you taste the top South South African, for instance, Sauvignon Blancs, how great it is. But it's just great to see how how great the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are. That not that our Sauvignon Blancs are not that good, but uh, it's just at the next level. Um, yeah, I was thinking in, 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 in America, the different styles in terms of Chardonnay, those heavy, buttery um, type of uh, Chardonnays that they drink. Um, and that's that's what their consumers want. Um, and then tasting the Zinvandels, harvesting it at a very high sugar that we are not used to. Um, and what they do to make it uh, say drinkable from that high sugar. Um, yeah, there's some fascinating stuff that, that we've learned and, and, and brought back. It's experience you now give to Laborie, but you've had some time elsewhere. In fact, you've spent time with two of my favorite estates, and uh, one in particular was one of the very first estates I discovered when I moved down to the University of Cape Town from uh, school in Zimbabwe, and we went off on a wine route, uh, and we uh, we ended up at this place called Dupier Estate, and they had this wine called Poller's Red, which yes. was about... 20 rand a bottle and was magnificent for a student because it, uh, it drunk delightfully and it was very, very inexpensive. Uh, both there and Opstal, we also spent two estates where uh, I think fit into most people's uh, top end of the list of, of great value, quite close to home as well for you. Uh, what, what was the time there like? How did, how did that affect you as the winemaker? Well, especially when I started the old style, was I was a very young guy, didn't know anything. Um, so uh, from Stanley Lowe, uh, who's the, the owner, 
I learned quite a lot, um, especially how to, to work hard. <laughs> um, and also you learned me quite a lot about business. Um, yeah, and making wine. Um, started from below, working in the cellar, learned how to filter. I will never forget how to bulk filter again. Um, but all the different styles that, that they do make, um, and especially the, the you know, the, the Shannon um, is, is really good quality. So, uh, and now the Semillon as well. So in terms of uh, basic winemaking, um, working hard in the cellar and business, I worked, learned quite a lot from, from, from Stanley and the family. Um, and I will always go back to them. They were all a really nice family, knowing Ati as well, who's the winemaker now, the son as well. Um, and I think the prayer was, um, it was a bigger, uh, a bigger estate. Um, we, we focused quite a lot on producing more bottled wine there, um, especially Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I learned quite a lot the basis about producing good quality Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and as you said, Paul has read, this is a K-blend, my introduction um, to a K-blend, um, especially with, there's almost more or less about 20% Pinotas in, in Paul has read. Um, but as you said, it's, it's a good all-rounder, it's a, it's a good value for money wine, um, and uh, I will never forget those days at both these estates. The journey then took you to Laborie and the wine we're going to be discussing in just a moment. It's the precursor to a wine that is mentioned by Greg Sherwood, who's busy watching in London. Loved the Laborie Blanc de Blanc MCC 2015 at the Decanter World Wine Awards, a worthy gold medal winner. We have the 2014 tonight, so Greg, I'll be trying that in just a moment. Before we do that, though, let's chat a little bit about the time at Laborie. Uh, Opstal Dupier then into the KWV empire, uh, which is a, a big step up in terms of the sheer size and the sheer scale. How intimidating was it moving into that space? Um, in, the, in the beginning, it was quite intimidating. Um, knew the basics of, of, of say, winemaking. And then you basically walk into the corporate world and you combine winemaking with corporate. Um, and today I look back and I... I I will make the choice again and again. Um, growing in, in in learning business, uh, growing in learning, um, producing bigger quality wine, but also the small portion, the small pocket of, of, of high quality um, wines, and being introduced in in receiving grapes from different regions um, and how to handle these different grapes in producing a certain style. Um, and I think that's that's a privilege for me working in in a place like uh, KWV or Library, um, and that helped me grow a lot in in the knowledge I have today. Um, taking a step back, uh, especially to uh, the pre-estate, that was actually my introduction in producing uh, Cap Classique. So that's where I learned how to make it, um, and that's still one of my my babies, one one of my my passions today. Um, and still learning every day um, quite a lot about uh, producing Cap Classique. Um, yeah, it's, it's been nine years it's, it's since I've been there. Um, it actually feels like yesterday I've started there um, and hope there's many, many years to still come. You mentioned the, uh, the time you spent there. It's time spent with a lot of other people. There's a big team in the broader KWV family. Mm. Uh, people like Giselle, who mentioned earlier, does such terrific work with the mentors range. Mm. What is it like having uh, that sort of support, that uh, that peer group around you to bounce mm. ideas off, to taste with, to uh, to check in with, and to, uh, I suppose, just have a, a really cool and knowledgeable group of wine friends around you? Oh, it's just it's just awesome then um it's really the nice thing is um everybody is experts in their own field um and it's always nice to as you said check in um if you're uncertain or something and you need a different opinion or you need help here or there with the tasting um especially with with uh someone like justin who we who's our chief winemaker just to just to call in just to um have a different opinion what he thinks um it really helps quite a lot um into grow in our quality um the quality that myself produces and at the end of the day 
we are all working to build the, the brand and to up the sales. Well, uh, if you keep winning decanter gold medals, I don't think sales will be too much of a problem because you're, <laughs> you're clearly getting some success. Uh, the, uh, the Blanc de Blanc is looking at me and asking to be drunk, and I will answer that call in just a second. Uh, it's one of a number. Uh, I know you've got a Brut, uh, you've got a Rosé. Uh, have I recently seen a, a Demi Sec as well? Yes. Uh, we, uh, firstly, we had the Blanc de Blanc and we had the Brut and Rosé. Um, and then we had a um, request from the market for, for uh, Demisec as well. And for that reason, we, we launched the, the Demisec um, last year. Um, and it's been doing well. Um, and I think the Demisec is a, it's a, it's a great category at this stage, especially for, for Cup Classic. Um, for someone that has been drinking normal sparkling wine and wants to be introduced uh, to, to Cup Classic, um, but doesn't really want that dry um, taste in the beginning. Um, I think uh, the Demisec is a great introduction for someone to start drinking a uh, cup classic. Give us uh, an idea in, in very basic terms uh, so that even I can understand. Uh, Demisec is obviously sweeter. It's got a bit more sugar. How do you manage that process? Is it you kind of pouring some Hewlett's into a large vat and waiting till you've got enough? Or how do, how do you manage that sweetness, that sugar? <laughs> so um, just to start from the beginning, uh, Cup Classic, uh, to call it the Cup Classic, you do your first fermentation in tank, um, which is your, your base wine. Um, then from there you do your blending and then um, you do your second fermentation in the bottle. So after the second fermentation is done, your, your wine is dry. Um, and that, that, it, um, that is for all the different, the Blanc de Blancs, the Brutes, um, all the different styles. Um, and by law now you need to, from next year, actually now at this stage is nine months that you need to age in the, in the bottle. Uh, from, from 2022, the legislation will change that you must age for at least uh, 12 months um, in the bottle. So after aging, you go through the process where you need to remove all the, the sediment or the lees inside, which is your dead yeast cells in the bottle, which is called your riddling process. Um, after that, um, how you remove that um, that leaves from the bottle is through the degaussing process um, where you remove the crown cap which is sealed with basically the same as that, that beer cap um, that you remove and inside you re then you remove the lease the frozen lease as well with the process um, and then you adjust the, the sweetness um, according to the sugar level where you find the best balance and that you do by tasting before you do the degaussing process with, with trials um, so in terms for, for, for brute, it needs to be below 12 grams of sugar level. Um, but for demisec, it needs to be between 35 and, and 50 grams per liter. So it's quite, it's quite, actually quite high if you, if you look at the numbers. Um, our demisec, we aim for the 40 grams per liter. So that's where we adjust the sugar level. And that's where we find that uh, the best balance is achieved. It's a wine that is frequently referred to as nectar, as Tanya Blonde mm. points out. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Good to have you watching once again. So that sugar level is something of an art and something of a science. Uh, so too is the aging, although there's not much you can do really other than stick it away somewhere and, and let it get on with its own, uh, its own job. Um, but you do that for a long time because although it's nine months now, it's about to be 12 months, uh, you guys go a bit further than that. Uh, 2015, as Greg Sherwood suggested, is currently on the market. I've got the 2014 here. If 2015 is just out, that six years that you're keeping that? Um, yes, Dan, that's where I got to uh, learn to be patient. Um, I think that's one of the most important aspects when it comes to um, aging Cup Classic. Um, although the legislation will change to 12 months next year, our minimum for the rosé, for instance, is 18 months. Um, and from there on, uh, the brute is minimum 24 months. Um, some of the, the, the vintages does age longer. Um, if you look at the 2014 and the 2015 uh, Blanc de Blanc, we aged it for, for 60 months plus. Um, and what we do is we do taste it every year um, as, it is, as it ages in the bottle. Um, 
and to determine what will be the best uh, time to degorge. Um, and that's where the, the patience comes in because uh, you always wanted to just um, degorge and, 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 and uh, sell it to the market because you're excited about the quality. But uh, sometimes just waiting for another year um, will just lift the quality more. Well, let's see how that quality sits. The expectations are high, not just from me, but also from Reginald Peckler, who's a very loyal and devoted follower of the show. Good to have you on, Reggie. Laborie carries a heavyweight tradition of Huguenot's masterpiece. I've been enjoying and will always enjoy the MCC classic it is. Thank you, Reggie, at Cheetah Plains, where he runs one of the finest sellers you'll find in the Kruger National Park and surrounds. All right, 2014, so this is now seven years old, as I have my long overdue first sip, Corbus. Uh, tell me what's <laughs> in my glass. Okay, so it was actually, uh, it was aged for 60 months uh, um, in the bottle under lease, and then we degorged it, and it was aged for another year, another year on the cork before we released it. Um, so if you look at, at, at the blend, it's 100% uh, Chardonnay. Um, and Chardonnay gives you that potential to age much longer because uh, the base wine, in terms of um, the, the quality and the purity, is much more tight and much more lean in the beginning. So that's the reason why we can age it longer uh, compared to a Brut, which has a Pinot Noir that gives you more roundness and more approachability. So for that reason, you ate it much less. But if you look at the 24, 2014 uh, Blanc de Blanc, uh, you'll see some, some notes of apple, uh, some citrus, um, but there's this nice, uh, creamy, uh, toasty, hazelnut flavors on the nose, which gives you that richness on the nose. And I think the best thing, and true to a, a Blanc de Blanc, uh, is that, that purity, that freshness, that focus, that tightness, even for wine that's been aging for, for, for six years, it's still fresh on the palate. Um, and, and that's true to a, a good quality Blanc de Blanc. Does that suggest then, Corbus, that although this is uh, got a good few years behind it already, uh, that we yeah. give it even longer? Yeah, sure. You can, um, the aging is actually done now. Um, but you can really, you can really age it for another three, four years, uh, even on the cork, um, in the right conditions, um, even longer. I'm not sure, um, but it's a wine made that that can really age for for quite a few years still. Uh, buy a couple of cases and just keep opening another bottle each year and see how it develops and unfolds. Uh, drinking this on its own, fabulous. Drinking it with food, uh, particularly given it's a Blanc de Blanc, it's got that Chardonnay base, I suspect could offer even greater reward. Uh, what's on the dinner table in the Van der Merwe household if we're drinking the Blanc de Blanc from Laborie? There's, there's only one dish and that's sushi. <laughs> in the fun of Mary house <laughs> but you can really enjoy it with a with, with lot more um, especially the, the not even the lighter dishes but I would say a nice nice security something that's, that shows some fattiness that, that acid line really breaks through that, that fattiness um, a really nice creamy salad will also do um, but it's your own choice it's, it's a wine that I actually on, enjoy on my own uh, or on its own, um, but truly, uh, yeah, the sushi is, is is the best choice for us at home. <laughs> oh, I think my dinner plans might be changing for tonight. That does sound <laughs> very, very appealing. Uh, the, the status of Cup Classic, I think we're now in a place, Corbus, where South African Cup Classic is recognised well beyond just our borders. People like Peter Ferreira sending the story far and wide. We're now 50 years in from celebrating that very first bottle out of Simonsach. Uh, where do you see Cup Classique now in terms of the South African wine landscape? Um, I think uh, Cup Classique is really doing well. Um, as I said, I, I've been making Cup Classique since 2009 and still learning every day. Um, and I think uh, the most important aspect is the, the association. The focus is on producing um, and lifting the quality um, of the Cup Classic, and not only as as an individual uh, brand or producer, but as a whole 
uh, as a couple of seeker association and that's that's a great thing to be to be part of the association and i think that's a reason why couple of seek is is been here for 50 years um it's been growing exceptionally um as i said uh, earlier 15 percent year on year um and for that reason the quality is up there and i think we can really uh compete with the, the best of the best in the world um, we don't have to stand back for, for the champagnes and the carvers and the Francia Cortas. I think in terms of quality, we are up there. Um, and I think for that reason, we can really, really celebrate a couple of seek, um, especially the 50 years. And that's exactly what we're doing on Dan Really Likes Wine throughout the course of the year. And once the ban is lifted, there is a terrific range of Cup Classique ad pick and pay for you to go and stock up on and celebrate the return of better times. As we look at uh, Ad Cup Classique, you mentioned that it's uh, uh, nine years now that you have been making it. Uh, where does it sit on the difficulty scale of producing wine as opposed to some of the other varietals that you work with? Um, I think definitely one of the more difficult. Um, then there's so much variables when it comes to producing a uh, cup classic. Um, it's the terroir, the the clones, um, the winemaking style. Uh, when it comes to the second fermentation in the bottle, even the 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 crown cap that you use, the the permeability of that crown cap. Um, the, the sods that you use at the end of the day, you can totally change your, your blend or your style um, just by adding your dosards, which is normally um, in our case about 2%. That's that's the small, how small it is and the influence it has. Um, and when you when you make up your blend, you must know how will that wine look in in two years, how will it look in six years? Um, and I think that's where the diff difficulty comes in. Um, but that's a reason why it keeps us as, as winemakers on our toes. Um, and I think that's why I enjoy it uh, the most. And that's why it's my passion. Where in five years' time, as we look forward, would you like to see South African Cup Plus Seek? And as we, uh, as we drift to the end of what's been a lovely conversation with you, uh, where's La Bourie going? Where are you taking your wine over the next few years? What's on the horizon? Well, then, then hope uh, definitely uh, growing the, the volumes, growing the brand, the visibility. Um, and I think uh, especially growing La Bourie in the export market, as most of it is um, selling locally, I would like to uh, see it um, um, growing in the export market. Um, yeah, probably um, adding some more styles, uh, some new cultivars, uh, something different uh, to the lineup, um, especially on the white side. Um, yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens in five years. Uh, at the moment it's hard to predict what's going to happen in five weeks in South Africa but uh, sometimes almost looking further ahead does seem just a little easier uh, last couple for you I can see uh, Tinas is almost ready to join us from Fram uh, the, uh, the fraternity the community among South African winemakers is something I love there's always such a great bond and I never get a sense of, uh, of nasty competition you're all backing each other up supporting each other to that end uh, give us one of the, the winemakers who has, has really inspired you. And as we're talking about the Laborie here, uh, uh, and another bottle of bubbles uh, that you've found, that you've discovered, uh, that just really speaks to you as a winemaker. Oh, Dan, there's, there's actually a, quite a, a lot of winemakers, especially the, the experts in, in the industry. Um, I think in terms of, of um, when I look at a couple of sick, especially Peter Ferreira, um, you can always call him. We always have time for you. Um, there's always an answer, always help. Um, and uh, it's great to have a mentor like that, uh, especially when it comes to Cup Classic and, and, and growing the category and going, growing the industry. Um, other winemakers that have uh, worked, um, and, I, and I think what, what I know today is because of, of what I've learned from him, um, is Johan Fury from Benguela Cove. Um, he was the winemaker at KWV, and uh, I really learned quite a lot, especially starting at KWV of La Bourie at that stage. Really learned quite a lot from him. Um, 
Yeah, and then there's also there's quite there's a lot. Uh, Vim Treater also worked with him. Um, he's also an exceptional guy. Um, his knowledge, um, not only about making wine, but business, the wine business, the industry, his world knowledge. Um, and if you look at those guys, that inspires us as young winemakers uh, and just want us to uh, learn more and uh, know what they know. And that just keeps us going. Again, it just speaks to, to what a great community we have in the South African wine world and such a needed community, uh, given the fact uh, that the uh, the times are going through are so challenging. Uh, you've uplifted the spirits uh, with uh, the history of your wine journey, as well as some great Cup the 2014 Blanc de Blanc from Laborie, uh, the uh, following vintage of which has just got a gold at Decanter. Uh, Corbus, lovely wine. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very, very much for joining us. I look forward to having you back on again soon. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thank you for, for having me. And it was it was great fun, eh? Cheers. Corbus van der Merwe, wonderful story there. Time in New Zealand, time in America, uh, time at Opstal and at Dupreer, and now overseeing the winemaking at Laborie. And amongst that wine, the 2014 Laborie Blanc de Blanc. It's the 2015 currently in the market. It's a 2015 with a decanter gold medal. Greg Sherwood giving it a very big thumbs up as one to look out for once we can go shopping. And by that, I mean proper shopping. <sighs> as soon as possible. Right, let's head over to our second guest today uh, who joins us and it's a very warm welcome uh, to uh, wine and a winemaker. We've both got terrific stories to tell from FRAM, all in capital letters. A warm welcome, Tinas. Thank you for joining us. Son Dan really likes wine. Hi, Dan. Uh, good to see you and, and good to be tasting a glass of wine with you, all from the safety of our own home. <laughs> and uh, being safely in your home has uh, hasn't felt quite this important for some time. Uh, challenging times in South Africa, so let's try and uplift the mood as we did with Corvus by drinking some grey wine and by finding out some history and some stories. Uh, because uh, when you look at your labels and you start reading them, uh, there is a, a cracking backstory to Fram, and I, it seems to involve a Norwegian ship. Is that correct? Um, yes, I. Uh... A few years ago, well, many years, 20, two, three years ago, I was at university and I, one day I went to the library and I had to study, um, but I, I didn't feel like studying. And uh, so I went to the nearest bookshelf and I, I got a book out of the shelf and it was about a guy that made a trip to Antarctica, um, Ernest Shackleton. And then I liked the story and the, the exploration. And then I read one or two other books and, and there's a very famous boat uh that was sailed to the north and south pole at that time um the boat is called from it's uh by a norwegian guy fridjof nansen or he didn't build it but he sailed in it and today if you're ever in oslo um just outside of the city center of oslo it's a it's a museum i think it's norway's most visited museum if i recall correctly and anyway so it's just um from the word from is the norwegian word for um going forward and uh you know i i used to work for two big wine companies i worked for the stell and for boschendal and i enjoyed working there but uh then at, at some time i said okay i'm, I'm gonna do make my own wines um, and um so you start a business and you you have to call the business something and i and i thought going forward seemed like a fairly good idea when you have a business you don't go forward every day, but as long as you go forward more days than you go backwards, I think think you're doing all right. And yeah, and the from is just um, also when you, when you make wine in, in, in South Africa, where there's so many different areas to grow grapes and so many different really great spots, um, you'll always be searching, doing your own sort of adventure, exploring, and, and trying to find uh, trying to find a good vineyard and good wines out there. That that's why it's named after after the boat it's a it's a terrific terrific story and in fact i think i've actually been to that museum i was in oslo 
cool about 10 years ago now uh, and went over and there were some Viking ships and I think it was that very same boat and it was it was seriously cool uh, which is appropriate for a seriously cool winemaker in fact I think it was Emil Joubert who first dubbed you as one of South Africa's proper wine rock stars uh, saying goodbye to uh, to Dessel, saying goodbye to Bosch and Dahl, moving in to this new space of Bram. It's not quite so new anymore. But how, how much of a leap of faith was that? How how scary, how keeping you awake at night, wondering if it's all going to work, was it making that leap? Um, yeah, I, I think it's – you. the thing is you you know what you want to do and, and there's sort of the the – certain things that you know you're not sure about but what's the, the the people call the the unknown unknowns you know the things that you didn't know about back then i think at the end um the things that keeps you awake during the first couple of years and even still i mean this it's been going for eight years now but there's still some some unknown unknowns so if you if you ask me i think i had a fairly good idea by that time i've been making wine for 12 years into two larger companies so I, I I back myself on the winemaking side, but you know once you start your own business, um, it's almost like the winemaking becomes the the easiest bit of of, of the business. Um, there's a lot of other things that needs to be managed that needs to be done that that you weren't always aware of when you were working in a larger company. Um, so yeah, but it's a it's been a it's been a, a great journey. Um, if I could do it all over again, I won't do every single thing exactly the same, but I, I think I'd probably do 95% of the things exactly the same, and I don't think I'll change any of the the important bits. So, so yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been good. It's been good to me. Um, obviously, right now, if we really want to, there's there's a lot of things we we can sort of be critical about or can complain um, from a from a wine producer point of view. Um, but I mean, I, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to complain. I don't think it's, it's, it's worth it right now. We all have, we all have our things that we have to sort of knuckle down and get done. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still happy. <laughs> which is terrific to hear and it's a wonderful endorsement of the journey that you've taken you speak about not changing the important things well one of the key ones uh, would be grapes when one is making wine having a quick look at the chardonnay and the shiraz i'm going to be tasting in just a moment there's robertson adorned on the label of the chardonnay and there is swartland on the shiraz uh talk me through the business model your own vineyard you bring the grapes in how does the fram process work um so yes the at the moment, I buy grapes from different places. I, I make all of the wines in the Swartland, but the Shiraz is actually the only one where the grapes are from the Swartland as well. Um, recently, over the past year, I bought a piece of land with my wife, who's also in, in the wine industry. We bought a piece of land um, on the Piquet Boerberg, there to the back of Piquet Berg. Um, and so hopefully, if you buy Fram wines a few years down the line, some of it will be from uh, from my very own vineyards, but right now it's uh, it's all bought in fruit. Um, and I think one of the advantages of working for a large company is uh, they they source grapes from north, east, south, west, you know, all the all the corners of the South African wine industry. Um, and working there, you get a good feeling for. Um, for uh, wines that you like and areas that you like and i think that was an advantage when because uh, i worked with with chardonnay from robertson i worked with shira from swartland um during my, with my time at the bigger places so i think yeah one of the great advantages is the exposure you get to to the whole industry um yeah and so at the moment it's all it's all bought in i make it all myself um but uh, the grapes are all bought in and the reason why I, I chose um, the Robertson Chardonnay, it's just it's one of the. I mean, in South Africa, we we don't have the the great limestone you'll find in Champagne or the Loire or a place like that. But around Robertson, it's it's we do have a little bit of limestone. Now, I don't I don't say that it's uh, it's the same as that, but I I do feel that. Um, you find a, a little bit extra 
dimension and a little bit of an extra layer or two to Chardonnay grown in, in, in those type of soils. Um, and that was the reason why I, I selected Chardonnay from that area. And, and it's also because I like to drink it. You know, when you, when you do your own business, when you're your own boss, um, uh, you might just as well make wines that you really like to drink. Uh, it would be slightly problematic if that weren't the case. Uh, Robert's in a great spot to, to get Chardonnay out of. The, uh, uh, the Devet Top Wines headlining uh, that particular example. And that is the first wine that we are going to be tasting. I'm going to grab the, uh, the bottle here, the, the label. You can see it's got that slightly uh, nautical feel to it uh, with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the fram on. Uh, and I'm just going to quote from the back of your bottle, if you don't mind, there. Uh, places right. like Rook. Oku don't show up on any maps, not because they're not there, just because the only way to find them is to go looking for them. The same for true Chardonnay vineyards. Uh, so where, what is it when you find this vineyard? Uh, how do you envisage, how do you look at it, try the soil, taste that grape and say, you know what, this is the one for me. This is going to make something really special. Um, Dan, I think as you're well aware that uh, – in South Africa, the whole winemaking community is we're we're a relatively small um, community. Um, we're all friendly. We all help each other out. And um, I would like to tell you that you know I just I just drive in my car and I you know the vineyard infuses through the air and it speaks to me and and somehow I have this uh, this great vision. But more often than not. You know, you have friends that make wine and you speak to them and they say, you know, they've worked with a vineyard here or they've worked with a vineyard there. Um, and you go to their wineries or you go taste somewhere else and you, you say, okay, but I really like this. Where is this from? Um, so, yeah, it's uh, the the Chardonnay, it's it's like that. It's um, I, I stumbled on, on it through um, through people more familiar with, with the area and the same as with the, the Pinotage I do the the Chenin Blanc I do the, the Shiraz it's all it's all you know we're in an industry and I know that if I can help somebody else to make better wine um, and the more better wine out there from South Africa the the more you know it's to my advantage as well so unfortunately I don't have a very romantic answer but I the answer is that almost all the vineyards I work with today I found through through friends in the in the in the industry that that puts you on a lead. It's not like every time you, you go and you try a vineyard and you taste the wine. It's not always something you feel can work for you. But um, yeah, that's the that's how the love was spread. I think there's a little romance to that, the friendship in the wine industry spreading its way around. And it gives us this Chardonnay. Just before I had tasted, if I think back, some of your earlier Chardonnay, I think had a splash of Chenin in and was also unoaked. Is that the case with this one? Yeah, this one is unoaked, 100% unoaked. Um, in, the, in the 2020, there's actually no Chenin Blanc. Um, what I would do... I can honestly say that all the, the Chardonnay is 100% unoaked, but some years I I throw in a little bit of a, a lie. It's not really bad lie, but it is. Uh, if I have one or two barrels of Chenin Blanc that I don't want to put into my Chenin Blanc blend, I uh, I sometimes back blend them into the Chardonnay. Um, so then the Chardonnay is still unwooded, but the, sh the Chenin is wooded. So, I mean... It's you know it's not a one hundred percent the truth always, but in in twenty twenty this vintage is actually one hundred percent unwooded um, chardonnay. Yes. Well, if uh, if the wine is as good as it has been in the past, I think we can forgive you a little deception there, uh, Mr. Krieger. So let me taste this. This is the unoaked chardonnay. Um, as I sample it, uh, give me an introduction to this particular wine, if you will. Okay, so so this is a 2020, um, the unwooded Chardonnay. For me, in 2020, there was more like a, a yellow citrus, uh, yellow and a green citrus on, on the entry of the wine. Um, some years it's a little bit riper, some years it's a little bit more orange citrus, but 2020, um, that, that bright green and yellow citrus flavors. And for me, in this area, that I always find is a, cereal um, like dried oats uh, when you open a bag of oats or or um, when you walk through a, a 
a field of, of wheat when it's um, when it's ready to be harvested that that cereal cereal notes combined with the the fresh citrus uh, I think that that's for me quite uh, pronounced in the 2020 and that fresh citrus is, is allowed to really show off because you've you've decided not to use that wood. And it, I think it's a general trend with South African Chardonnay where uh, the use of wood has been scaled down and there's not nearly as much new oak in particular that has been used. Completely un-oaked Chardonnay, though, is uh, is still uh, it's it's not, not the, the norm. Um, but if we speak to your earlier comment of making wine that you like, I'm assuming that this is a style that particularly appeals to you. Um. Yeah, it's a it's a wine that I I said to myself starting out I'm I was gonna make two white wines, uh, a Chenin Blanc and a Chardonnay, and I, I had the idea that the Chenin Blanc would probably be um, from older oak barrels, um, and then I said to myself, okay, but then if I make two wines and I take both home to drink, I don't want to drink two oak wines, um, and and I always, always liked the the freshness from from Chardonnay because I felt, and you will know that in the early two thousands in South Africa, well, not only South Africa, I suppose all over the world, people were using a hundred percent new oak, um, and you you didn't have to to taste the wine to see if somebody was drinking Chardonnay. You could sit on the other end of a restaurant, and you could see that guy over there is drinking Chardonnay because it had that pale yellow almost orange hue to it um, and luckily uh, nowadays we, when people go to restaurants when people drink wine there's, there's a lot more emphasis on freshness um, and this when I started doing this eight nine years ago I said to myself also I, I want to retain some of that freshness some of that that sort of the beauty of the fruit of Chardonnay I want that to be in the glass that's what I want to be drinking um, and I don't want it to be masked by uh, by a lot of oak um, there's there's some great chardonnays that that has got 100 percent new oak but in south africa they're few and far between um, and i do think that we've we've come a long way in, in making wines fresher even those that do go into barrel i think people use older oak um, on lots of whites that that still showcases the fruit a lot a lot better but yeah so when i made this i said to myself i want to see I want purity and I want definition. Um, and yeah, and to do it unoaked, that was the way to do it. I love the element of indulgence in making your own wine. You can decide exactly what you like. That's what you're going to make. And that's brilliant. Uh, and it extends, I've got no doubt, to the other wine we're trying. This is some Shiraz. Uh, and this is from a little closer to where you're actually making it. Uh, where in the Swartland is this from? Um, that's the 2019. I'm actually drinking the 2020 tonight. Um, I don't have a bottle of 2019 at home, or I probably have one somewhere. I just couldn't find it for the show. Um, the 2019 is um, from two vineyards. The one is on just outside of Marmesbury, uh, on the well, that's the eastern side on, towards Paul, but it would be the almost the first vineyard as you leave the town of Marmesbury on the R45. Um, and the second one is uh, continuing along the R45 towards Paul, but probably closer to Paul. So um, the first one is a is a combination of of uh, granite and and iron soils, um, a bit more structure. Where the second one closer to Paul is is a bit is more granite and, and a bit more sandy. Doesn't have the the structure and iron component that that's in in the first vineyard. Before we continue with the Shiraz, just a quick word from uh, Reggie up at Cheetah Plains. Uh, going back to our earlier wine tennis, I must attest your precious gems out there. Those Chardonnays are heart and soul for simply happiness. Mm, I can actually hear Reggie saying exactly that. So uh, one of your many, many, many fans uh, you've got there, Tinas. Uh, in terms of the uh, the Shiraz, it's a great part of the world for making Shiraz. This we know well. What influences the style of Shiraz that we find in the glass? Um, Dan, for me, uh, similar to to the to the Chardonnay, I want to I want the, the fruitiness to be first and foremost. I like I like fruit, and then on all the red wines I do, I like tannin. Um, 
for the reason for that is in in south africa it's it we have a warmer climate we have a lot of sun so often we don't have the great natural acidities or the the good natural phs you would find in in places with a little bit less sun and a little bit less uh, heat we want our advantages we have fruit um but so with, with tannin i try and i actually I, I won't say i overwork the grapes but i do a lot of pump overs i do a lot of punch downs i do a lot of extraction during the the two or three weeks that of the primary fermentation and i do that because i want to i want to get a lot of tannin out of the wine because for me tannin um it is something that can add freshness to the to the end of the palate that last third of the palate where you know if you have a a, a a good natural acidity even at a higher alcohol you'll find uh you'll find freshness it won't become cloy it won't become uh, uh, you won't feel saturated and i think in south africa if we work well with tannin because we have we do have beautiful and we have great tannin in this country uh, so I've, I've always felt to to add freshness um, with tannin, uh, using that in my wines. I also do a little bit of whole bunch fermentation. It's not a lot. It's if I have to take a guess, um, it's around twenty percent, maybe twenty five percent whole bunch fermentations. And once again, that's uh, that's adding another layer of of tannin in there. It's a different type of tannin. It brings a different type of freshness to the wine. Um, so yeah, that's uh, when when I do the Shiraz, it's still it should be fruity. It's all this is all in oak, but it's older oak, so you you'll find some of the, the subtlety. But for me, the oak is more a, a vessel in which uh, the wine can develop, um, the wine can uh, become a, become alive and and get something added to it from from that's not oak, but that's just that um, that slow uptake of oxygen and and making the wine more complex. Yeah. In terms of finalizing the process, settling on all the wine, we chatted a little earlier to Corbus about having that huge team around him at KWV and the value that all of those other winemakers add in having sounding boards and having confidants to bounce ideas off. Uh, I think it's Hanukkah is uh, the uh, uh, the other wine expert in the family. Right. Uh, how much of a role uh, does your wife have in, uh, in supporting, helping out, maybe occasionally correcting uh, some of the stuff that you do? Um. Yeah, um, Danek is in, here in the room right now, so I'm not sure how I should actually answer that question. Maybe I'll try to be to to have an, an honest answer, um, or maybe I should. I think it was Churchill that said that, you know, sometimes the the truth is so precious you have to wrap it in a, in a layer of lies just to protect it from itself. Um, <laughs> but no, um. It, it it's definitely um, an advantage of, of having a uh, another wine person um, in the in in the room. Um, it it's because you know you you have an idea of what you want to do, and and sometimes you you you're you're looking down one avenue trying to get to the end result, and it's almost like if somebody can just tell you, but okay, what you're gonna try now probably won't get you there or it will get you there with a lot of effort but have you thought of just going in in this side direction or in that side direction um because you know we, i think we all in life we we it's not like i'm set in my ways but i have a way of doing things and um and most of the time they work for me but sometimes you just need someone to say, tell you you know have a little bit of a wider view so um no, it is very handy i'll, I'll admit that <laughs> I think a very diplomatic response there, uh, Tina. Just before we let you go, as we wrap up this Monday's edition of Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay, a wonderful collection of wine, but every winemaker always seems to have a, a winemaking itch they still want to scratch. Uh, what is on the horizon? What uh, new, different other wine can we expect in the next uh, couple of years to come out of Fram? Um you know what i uh, i've i made a lot of cab over the years um and over the last eight nine years i haven't made any any cabernet souvenir and and i mean that's not it's the world's most planted grape so i can't claim that it's uh you know that it's um building a new frontier or going where nobody has gone before 
but it, it's a it's a, it's a wine that um, that you know recently I, I drank one or two all the all the cabs from South Africa and it's just um, it is a, it's a great grape variety and and I've actually been thinking that if we do plant grapes there on on Piquet Boerberg um, I'd I'll be very tempted to plant a little bit of, of Cabernet um, so so maybe it's really like that there's nothing new in the world maybe the new thing i'll do is the thing that's been done all over the world for 120 or 150 or 500 years so i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure when when it, it will be out there but yeah i'm, I'm thinking a, a frame cab is somewhere on the cards <laughs> we look out for it put me at the head of that queue to grab some when it does come out uh Dennis, thank you so much for joining us uh, thank you for uh, adding a, a little light uh, to a fairly dark start to the week for South Africa. Uh, keep making terrific wine. It's a uh, wine that's clearly made with a great deal of fun, a great deal of passion, a great deal of self-indulgence, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, keep enjoying and look forward to having you back on the show again soon. Thank you, Dan. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'm sure all those Fram wines you, you have with you, you bought them a long time before the lockdown. You're a good man. <laughs> Indeed, I did. Only just before that. Only just before. Uh, Tina Escrua from Fram Wines joining us on the show, along with Quibus, who uh, joined us a little earlier from Laborie with his bubbles and some more great South African wine that you'll enjoy just as soon as you can get your hands on it. Two weeks and counting, we hope, most fervently. That does it for this evening. We'll be back again with you live on Thursday, by which stage hopefully South Africa has calmed down a little and we're all feeling just a little more upbeat. I hope your wine stocks haven't run out just yet. Make sure, though, that you're ready to restock and refill either online or down at your local pick and pay just as soon as the regulations change. Big thank you to Corbus. Big thank you to Tina's. Thank you to all of you for watching and supporting the show. I'll see you back again on Thursday. Glass of wine in hand. See you then. Goodbye. To join the Pick and Pay Wine Club, simply SMS your smart shopper number to 36775. It's absolutely free and you'll get for yourself three times the smart shopper points on every bottle of wine bought. You'll also get a 20% discount on 10 different wines each month, a 25% discount on a case of wine and a magnum, some terrific competitions and invitations to awesome events.